If you go to Gettysburg and you look at the monument of the 14th Indiana on East Cemetery Hill, you'll see amongst all the great battles, Gettysburg, Antietam, you'll see two battles on that really don't classify as battles. But the men of the 14th Indiana were so proud of what they had done that the first one that you see on there is Cheat Mountain, and this is the battle that I'm, I'm referring to now. Second one is in October, and that's the Battle of Greenbrier. Neither one of which really classifies as a battle. It's about 300 Union soldiers at Cheat Mountain versus about 1,000 Confederate soldiers. This is a skirmish. But they are so proud, even into the 1880s when they dedicate their monument at Gettysburg, of what they were able to accomplish, because of course by this time, by the time they dedicate that monument, Jackson and Lee are the great heroes of the South. And the fact that they, as the 14th Indiana, had defeated both Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, they were incredibly proud of. They were also incredibly proud of their commander, Nathan Kimball. He will eventually move into, um, he will stay in West Virginia up until the spring of 1862, when of course, as the Union Army moves up the valley, keep in mind for those of you who are not familiar with this t the terminology, because the Shenandoah River flows south to north, up is south, north is to our, is, uh, down the valley, sorry. All right, so north is down. So as the Union forces are moving up the valley and the Union, and they start sending troops away to reinforce McClellan's Peninsula campaign, Jackson will move back down the valley and will attack them right here on March 23rd, 1862. Well, the previous day, March 22nd, the commander of the division, James Shields, had been wounded about a mile or so north of us at where Malloy Ford is now. It's uh, Milltown. So he's wounded there. So the following day, Nathan Kimball's in command of the division. And so he will defeat Jackson here at Kernstown. And definitely, if you have time afterwards, for those of you who are, who are not staff members, I would definitely recommend taking a time to, to walk the grounds if you have not done so already. He will be promoted to Brigadier General. And as they shift out of the valley, because they're sent to, they, their job is actually to reinforce McClellan's forces approaching Richmond. As they are sent out of the valley, Suddenly Jackson turns on them and begins his, his famed Valley Campaign. And he will drive the Union forces out of Front Royal on the 23rd of May. The 25th of May, he will drive them here from, Rich, from Winchester. And now Jack, uh, Shields Division, Shields is back in command by this time, Shields Division will ha have just reached Fredericksburg and receive orders to turn their carcasses around and march all the way back to Front Royal. Kimball, is in the lead brigade and he is, he is given special orders to retake the town at all hazards. They must take the town of Front Royal. He moves in there, takes the town, and for those of you who are familiar with the May 23rd Battle of Front Royal, you might have heard of a young lady of the town named Bell Boyd. Well, Nathan Kimball, when he comes into town, happens to also hear of this young lady named Bell Boyd, who had happened to help the Confederates on May 23rd, so he has her arrested. So yes, like I said, he just shows up. Here he is, arresting Bell Boyd. So, however, James Shields, who uh, is rather soft, will have her released on good behavior, of course. Throughout the rest of the Valley Campaign, Kimball himself will do a whole, heck, a whole lot more with the rest of the Valley Campaign. He will be, as he marches south, of course, part of Shields' division will be defeated at Port Republic on June 9th, but Kimball is not in that battle. He will go all the way down. Not only is he the un only Union officer to defeat both Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson in separate battles, he also happens to be, he also is included in one of those few who have defeated Stuart in another battle. All right. He goes all the way down around. McClellan finally gets his reinforcements at the very, very beginning part of July. On July 2nd, 1862, Nathan Kimball's brigade will finally arrive at Harrison's Landing, where they should have been two months prior to that. And they will finally get there, and they will promptly go into battle against Jeb Stewart's cavalry and drive them off <laughs> at the Battle of Evelington Heights. That's on July 3rd. We have the rest, rest of the, oh, go all the way up to Antietam, Okay, and this is where the Gibraltar Brigade will receive its name. Nathan Kimball is in the Second Corps Army of the Potomac. And just before the Battle of Antietam, some of you may be familiar with this story, others may not, but it is Special Orders 191. Now, Special Orders 191, for those of you who are not familiar with it, General Lee, when he invades the North, 
this first time around, September 62, he'll get to Frederick, Maryland, and he will write a copy of an order. He will write an order that will detail where his different forces are going to be, what their objectives are for the campaign. So General Walker, your forces are to go down and do that. General Jackson, your forces are to go down and do that. Well, there's one copy of it that's unaccounted for. That copy is found by two soldiers of the 27th Indiana. Now, the 27th Indiana is not in the Second Corps. Now, this is a plausible story. I will not say it is true, but it is at least plausible. There are facts that we know about this story. First thing, we do know that Special Orders 191 is found and it eventually makes its way to McClellan. Number two, the things we do know is that Silas Colgrove, the commander of the 27th Indiana, is the nephew-in-law, I guess if that's a real term. The Kimball and Silas Colgrove are related by marriage. Kimball is his uncle by marriage, so I guess nephew-in-law would be the correct term, if that's even like I said a term of Silas Colgrove, and the, and the Second Corps, which is Kimball's Corps, and the Twelfth Corps, which is Colgrove's Corps, happened to be camped together on the same day. And they happened to be, this is the story, is that they happened to be visiting together when this order is found. And when these two soldiers will bring the order to Colgrove, Kimball will recognize the value of it, so he says, and we'll take it to General Alpheus Williams, who's the commander of the 12th Corps, who will, take it, who will then have Kimball take it with a staff officer all the way up to George McClellan. Is that real? It's plausible. I won't say it's real. The only, the only um, uh, source, that's the source, that's the word I'm looking for. The only source that I have that talks about that, uh, that episode as Nathan Kimball is Nathan Kimball himself. He is the only one who actually talks about that. But the story is so varied from every other participant that it's just as plausible, unfortunately, as every other one. Move forward three days, September 17th, 1862. Nathan Kimball, this is where they earn their name, the Gibraltar Brigade. They are attacking the sunken road. And as they cross the roulette farm and they come up over the top of that hill, for those of you who have been to Antietam, you, you probably can picture exactly where I'm at. You're standing on top of, of the hill at the, at the um, not at the, um, the tower, but just down the hill from that tower. And you can see that hill that looks right over the, right over the top of the sunken road. And Kimball's men were marching straight up that road under fire from their flank, from the artillery, from S.D. Lee's uh, battalion of artillery on top of that hill where the visitor center is now. And they move forward and Kimball is heard to ex exclaim, God help my poor boys. Because the Gibraltar Brigade, the reason they earned that nickname is the same reason that they, the Iron Brigade earns its nickname two days before. Because they don't retreat. They're not there to retreat. They're there to be victorious. They lose fully one-third of their men, one-third of their numbers, at, right there in front of Bloody Lane. They are so badly beat up. Kimball, who, who should have been able to take over the command of the division, but the division is so badly destroyed at uh, attacking the sunken road. They have no reinforcements. They can't push forward to split Lee's army because there's nobody behind them once the, the sunken road position is taken, but they cannot do that. But they will have done this under the eyes of George McClellan, who will dub them the Gibraltar Brigade because they stood like the Rock of Gibraltar. All right, that's, the, that's the, where that comes from. Kimball, however, by this time is getting fed up with the culture of the Army of the Potomac. Nathan Kimball is not a career officer. He's not what we would term today a ring knocker, somebody who'd been to West Point, you know, sit there and knock their ring, okay? He's not what we term that today. He's just a, an amateur, he's a, he's a physician after all. He's, he's a doctor by trade. But he's fully capable of doing, as we've seen, fully capable of commanding a battle and winning. Well, the Army of the Potomac is not interested in that. They're interested in moving slowly in being a, an old boys club, being a West Point club. That's what they're interested in. So Nathan Kimball by this time is getting fed up with this. He believes that the Army of the Potomac can move much faster than it does. After all, Stonewall Jackson's moved much faster than they do, so why can't the boys of the Army of the Potomac move much faster than they do? So shortly thereafter, he will be given command of a reconnaissance in force from Sharpsburg, Maryland, down to Leesburg, Virginia, and he will make it in one day which is a heck of a long way to march in one day. By the time he gets down there, he, his brigade 
is completely decimated. There's a handful of soldiers and Nathan Kimball that make it to Leesburg. Everybody else is strung out along the road. So he pushed him a little too far. In fact, it's his low point in career as a military officer. And he has, they don't, they don't desert him. They don't desert the colors. They transfer. The men of the, of, the, of the Gibraltar Brigade start leaving. They start transferring to the artillery or to anywhere else they can get out because it's just not working for them. Well, They've, they've earned the nickname the Gibraltar Brigade and they've earned it hard because at Fredericksburg, which is the very next battle that we will be in, attacking Murray's Heights, and you can't really see it when you go to Murray's Heights today, but when you go to Murray's Heights, he's attacking up this, this long gradual slope. The very first brigade in, in battle, in that, the, that action, that wave that moves forward, is Nathan Kimball's Gibraltar Brigade. And he will be badly wounded. He will be, there's an artillery shell that will strike near him, and he will be wounded in the right leg. And he'll, he's, all, he's out of the battle. His brigade gets the closest of any of the brigades attacking the stone wall, about 30 yards is about where they, they end up getting to. And they're out there the rest of the afternoon. They run out of ammunition. Kimball, he's pretty well done, at least for this point in time. He, however, he by, this is of course the end of December 1862, he'll end up in Washington. And he's in Washington, which is where he meets the president. And he happens to be in Washington on January the 1st, 1863, for the issuing of the Emancipation Proclamation. <laughs> Another one of those places he just kind of shows up. All right. But he is convalescent enough that he is back in Indiana on uh, Valentine's Day, February 14th. He will be back there delivering a speech a pro-war speech and a pro-union speech to the citizens of Indiana and he, then he will shortly thereafter receive orders to report to General Grant for the Army of the Tennessee. So he is no longer in the Eastern Army. So now he can go and fight with what he probably would, would have said, although I, I can't say this for sure, what he probably would have said was a real soldier. Grant moves. Grant fights. And he recognizes that just as much as Lincoln ever did. So he gets out there, he takes command of what is termed Kimball's Provisional Division. He is a Brigadier General after all, so he's definitely capable of commanding a division and has been one since April of 62. So he's been a Brigadier General for over a year and commanded a division on several occasions. He will fight one, one battle under, under Grant, all right, and that'll be a battle at Yazoo City in Mississippi. He will then take command of Jackson, Mississippi as the post commandant. After that point, when, once Victor, uh, Vicksburg, I'm sorry, once Vicksburg surrenders, he will then end up going to Arkansas. What's he doing out in Arkansas? Well, keep in mind, he, he met the president when he was wounded. Well, now the president has a mission for Nathan Kimball. So, and he, this is not the first time that he will receive special orders from the White House. He will receive orders he will take his division and go, and go with Frederick Steele on the Arkansas expedition. They will capture uh, Little Rock, and then Nathan Kimball will be the military commander of Arkansas. He'll be the military governor of Arkansas. And he will discover a talent. I didn't mention this talent at the beginning because you have to discover it as much as, as Kimball himself did. Kimball does not know that he is an able administrator until he becomes the military governor of the state of Arkansas. Once he becomes the military governor, he himself is credited with administering the oath of allegiance to the United States to 1,000 individuals. Not bad.